Okay, so we start with the second lecture of the series of lectures on the on the minimal model graph propagation uh, with uh, our session. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. So um, uh, I was told to talk about MMP. So I believe it would be very boring for many of you. Sorry about that. Should blame the organizers, not me. But I'll try my best. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I do what I can. So I will talk about MMP for varieties of population at the same time. But let me start from the conjecture, first of all. So um, we work over C. And for me, X will be always a normal projective variety. Okay, almost always. Over the complex numbers of dimension n, just to fix a notation. So, and just to give you a definition, which I think was already mentioned at some point, but uh, let me remind you that X is called the unit rule. We're going to see a few different versions, but um, uh, let me start from here. Uh, if uh, for any general point, for any point, it doesn't really matter, there exists a rational curve. C contain, of course, inside X, uh, contain X. Okay, so the MMP for varieties, Um, it's um, an attempt to generalize the case of uh, um, the classification of algebraic surfaces uh, um, of the beginning of the last century. Um, and it's due to Mori. Basically, it says that there are two kinds of varieties those that are uniruled and those that are not uniruled. Okay, so let's see why. So, what we expect is that there exists always a Russian map. Let me call it Y. So let me say that um, it's going to be KX negative, where KX negative is similar to what Carlo mentioned yesterday. But um, I would like to skip this detail because I'm not saying anything about the singularity of X. So at the moment, I'm not assuming anything. I just say it's a Russian map. It can even extract divisor possibly. So let's just take it as an isomorphism over an open subset, um, the risky open subset, such that either X is in root and um, there exists a map from Y to Z, a morphism, sorry, from Y to Z, such that um, the dimension of Z is strictly less than N, so in other words, where n of course is the dimension of x. So in other words, is not a Barashian morphism. Uh, sorry, I should say a surjective with uh, surjective. Well, I'm gonna say it later, but let me emphasize it's surjective. Uh, such, uh, so either it's not a Barashian morphism, it's always contracting um, the general, general variety, a variety passing to general point. And the most important part is that the general fiber is not empty in this final. In other words, the canonical divisor of this fiber, it could be single, the fiber could be singular, but the canonical divisor is well defined and it's anti ample. Um, or X is not in root, and so KY it's NF. So, in other words, uh, KY times any curve is not negative. And actually, we can see more. So, um, I'm going to divide in two different cases. I will explain why I do this. Um, either, so we're going to call it 2A and 2B. So, either there exists a morphism, so sorry, and there exists a morphism uh, from Y to Z such that either Z is ample, 
So this is the case on which Kx is big, X is of Jones type. So most of the varieties are actually of Jones type. So most of the varieties will satisfy this property or um, Z is lower dimension. The dimension Z is very similar to here. The dimension Z is less than N. Sorry, here, either Kz is ample and Z is barrational. Or the dimension Z is strictly less than um, N and the jump fiber, it's gonna be L. So Calabiao means that, um, for me, means that um, the canonical divisor is numerically equivalent to zero. So, or even better, uh, purely equivalent to zero. So the general fiber F. Okay, so let me say, why do I explain this way? Because the standard thing that you read every time that you read about MMP is that uh, we expect there are three building blocks that are fun varieties, Calabiao's, and those with have the Z tempo. I mean, those are canonical polarized. So this is why people say that. I mean, because if the conjecture is true, then we really can decompose our variety after a Brasher map into three pieces. So Fano, Calabiao, and KZ tempo. So the question is how much is this for this is true for, for foliation. But before I say that, so first of all, not everything's a conjecture. Um, actually, Quite a bit is known. This is okay. So in other words, when I say okay, it's a theorem. And this is also okay. This is also a theorem. So this is the very much um, uh, open part, open part of this uh, conjecture. Okay, so you see that uh, um, if you do believe in this conjecture, and actually most of it, it's already been proven, um, there are fibration everywhere. So we want to study some kind of MMP for fibrations. So for me, a fibration, maybe let me write it explicitly. It's a morphism from X to Y, from a normal variety to a normal variety with connected fibers and this adjective. So using more algebraic geometry language, the push forward of the structure shift of, y, of X is equal to the structure shift of Y. Um, so we want to study somehow, can we somehow study the brush geometry of fibrations? And the point is that as soon as you change the model, as soon as you change from X to something which is brushed to X, you lose fibration, right? Like for instance, if you take P2 blow up P1 point, you have a pencil, which defines a fibration to P1. But uh, P2 itself does not have any interest in fibrations. So fibration not nice from a um, um, Barashian geometry point of view. Okay, what we like, it's a foliation. Yes. So, okay, yeah, that's a good point. So 2A means that it's exactly equivalent to Kx is big. So if you assume that Kx is big, then everything is okay, everything is known. If Kx is not big, but X is not in ruled, we don't know much, except in dimension. So sorry, maybe I should say in dimension three, thanks to Mori and many others, um, um, N equal to a lesser equal than three, it's okay. Sorry. Okay, so, there are many reasons why we like foliation. I'm sure many people in this room have different opinions, but one of the reasons is because every fibration defines a foliation and foliation are nice from um, a uh, barational uh, geometry point of view as we saw yesterday. So, uh, so let me say that assuming that F is a fibration, there exists an induced foliation given by Okay, here we need to be a little bit careful. I would like to write the kernel of the differential map from the tangent space, the tangent sheaf of X to the tangent, to the pullback of the tangent sheaf of Y. But this is a priori um, not saturated. I mean, almost never saturated actually, because we'll see several examples. There could be multiple fibers. So it might not satisfy the first 
second property, I don't remember, sorry, a column yesterday, uh, which says that uh, in the quotient with, uh, between Tx and Tf must be torsion free. So in order to save us, we take the saturation of this, which is um, uh, unique and well-defined. So, and this is exactly what defines saturation. It's easy to show that uh, it's closed under the bracket. And so this is called uh, um, algebraic integrable. And I, see, I think that Callum will talk about this object. I will keep this in mind. Of course, not all the foliation, most of the foliation are not algebraic integral, like we heard from uh, George yesterday, but um, this is a good example. So I'll keep this in mind for, uh, to produce examples. Okay, so I would like to generalize this picture for foliation. Uh, I can say that some things are true, some things are not true. So, but the question is, what is, what is that we can hope? So if you study any reference of Barashian geometry, they usually say, okay, the first thing that you can do is to apply Ronaka theorem. You can take any variety and you can uh, make it smooth. So there exists always a resolution singularity. So this is proper but rational, such that, um, uh, so resolution means that x did this move. Okay, so when I say this phi, you need to be careful because uh, I didn't assume anything about singularity. The first thing we do in order to start this program is to take a resolution singularities and then we start from there. Okay, so since I want to do uh, a comparison between foliation and varieties, the first ask, the question that we can ask, and that's already been mentioned by Callum, is there a resolution of singularities for foliation? And the answer is very much no. Almost never, yes. Why? Let's take an example. Uh, let's, say, let's consider this example. This is a good example. So let's suppose that we have a fabrication even a pansy on a surface with a single fiber, which is almost the case, almost always the case. So in this case, y is equal to c. And so it's a curve. So one fiber has a singularity. So this is a singular point, both for the fiber and for the foliation. So this is a point in the single locus of f. And you can blow up as much as you want. You're gonna make things even worse because uh, um, the more you, we blow up, the more we create singular points, right? So for instance, I can blow up one time and I'm gonna get something that looks like this. Okay, so you create one more single point. So surely blowing up does not help. Okay, so whatever definition you give for resolution singularities, we cannot hope that um, after a finite number of blow ups, we get something which has um, um, uh, no singularities at all. But we can do something like that. I mean, we can make surely singularity better. So, for instance, let me go back to the case of a pencil. We could have that we start with singularities which are much worse, like, for instance, a cusp. And this is bad from every point of view, meaning that um, even from a full, we don't want to consider foliation which have this kind of singularities. We like uh, better behaved singularities, but we know that we can blow up enough number of times in such a way that we get rid of this kind of bad singularities. You can make it better, right? So if after fine number of blow ups, we can easily arrive to the point. I think this is, if this is the usual cusp of minimal multiplicity, I think, uh, we can easily get something like this. Oops, sorry. Okay, so um, you blow up one, two, three times, and we get a three like that. Now the fiber is not reduced, and we're gonna. And that's exactly why we need to take saturations. So we're not gonna get anything for which the um, uh, the pre-image of a point as a scheme is smooth at the general point. But what we can easily get um, is that after a finite number of points, blow up.
they support a beach fiber. So they reduce part of each fiber. It's simple macros, which is the best we can hope, I mean, for this kind of foliation. Okay, so this foliation satisfies the property that they are um, canonical. So let me, let me generalize this picture. Let me give a definition. So this word was mentioned by Callum yesterday. Um, so on any variety, I'm sorry, normal variety, and F collision X, F is called canonical, or in other words, emits canonical singularity if, Okay, the first property, it's a little bit technical. It says that, I mean, this is very usual in variation geometry. We need to assume that KF is Cartier, which means that one multiple of KF, it's Cartier. And the second property, which is really the important part of this definition is that for any, okay, there are too many F, for any G uh, barational from X prime to X, X If I write the difference of KF prime by uh, the pullback of KF, so I will explain what is F prime, um, then the difference is effective. And of course, E is supporting the exceptional locus of G. Uh, here, F prime, it's already been mentioned yesterday, is the foliation. Um, uniquely induced uh, on Y. Okay, so this is not canonical, but this is canonical. Uh, let me give a couple more examples. Yes. Yeah, in this it was just an example. So it's a pencil on a surface, yes. You can, uh, uh, it's not quite clear to me what it means to be lock. We have some understanding, but not a complete understanding of what it means to be canonical for any random um, foliation induced by a fabrication. It does not mean that, the, for instance, there is no, nothing about that, nothing about the base that you can conclude by assuming that. It's a bit like saying that the fiber are nice but I'm not, I don't really know the, what is the correct generalization of this. Okay. Um, so yeah, two basic examples on a surface. One is the radial foliation. So given by, oops, something like that. Um, given by, yeah, another way to see it is the, um, fancy defined by a line on P2 or A2. This is not canonical. So it's easy to do a calculation by hand, it's a good exercise. Um, but another way to see it is that if you blow up the point, then the exceptional divisor, so maybe let me draw a picture. Uh, so if you blow up the point, the exceptional divisor E is not invariant. The leaves of the induced foliation, of course, are the vertical curves. I mean, the lines defined by this pencil. And so uh, E cannot be invariant. And so this means that it's bad singularity. I mean, it's a non-decritical singularity or something like that. No, no non-decritical, something like that. But anyway, yeah, it's pretty bad. A much better singularity is the, it was mentioned yesterday, uh, something looks like this, which is actually, it's the same as this, more or less. I mean, just a different way to see it. So this is canonical. And I believe it's defined by something like that. Okay, so we mentioned Ronaka theorem and, uh, and now the question is, uh, 
can we find an equivalent statement for for foliations um, in full generality? By the way, I forgot to mention. Um, yes. Oh, um, explain. Thank you very much. No, no, it will be automatic, at least conjecturally, it will be automatic that uh, um, if you blow up points, then it will be. I mean, like for instance, you could have to blow up a non invariant curve, right? And so this implies that there isn't the exceptional locus. Even if you start with something smooth, the exceptional locus will not be, might not be invariant. So, yeah, no, we don't assume anything at all. Well, so the conjecture, I think it's a conjecture, uh, is that um, canonical implies non decritical. And I'm sure. But then it's invariant of the exceptional divisor center. Oh, points. Yeah, yeah, the shite. Okay. Yeah, the shite, exactly. Yes. So I didn't define what non decritical is, but that's exactly what it means. And it's a theorem for n less or equal than 3. Let's call, as Callum say, uh, it should follow from MMP. Non-decritical. Non-decritical means exactly yeah, what George was saying. Basically, the idea is that, let's suppose, for instance, we're on surface. Uh, if you blow up a point, the exceptional locus uh, um, is supposed to be invariant. So this should be in any dimension. Do we know if it's true in higher dimension than three? More or less, we do expect to be true, but I think that written down, it's only written down in dimension three and two. Maybe, oh yeah, it's rank one, that's right, sorry. Yes, and rank one. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes. Two mistakes in two lines, yes, thank you. Yeah, and that's a, that's a good point. That's exactly why we need these technicals. I forgot to mention. Uh, this is a technical assumption, but without this, it would be hard to define the, the pullback. I mean, it would be actually impossible to define the pullback of KF. So that's exactly why one is needed in order to go ahead with two. Thank you. And I forgot to mention a very simple example. I, I didn't mention it, but I, I've hidden it somewhere. Um, the example that we should always keep in mind is, uh, so this is a trivial example, but it's useful to keep in mind is when tf or f is equal to tx. So in other words, when in my previous, uh, well, it was here somewhere, uh, in my previous notation, y it's a point. So you have a fabrication to a point, which is a fabrication from every point of view. And this is a good example to keep in mind because for instance, uh, you can ask, uh, is there any difference between the usual canonical singularities that we heard uh, in Barashian geometry with these canonical singularities uh, um, which are due to McQuillan, I believe. And uh, the answer is not. If you assume that this is the case, then it's exactly the same definition. So for instance, uh, we know that for surfaces, uh, canonical singularity is exactly the same as saying that is Duval or whichever um, characterization you want of canonical singularities for in dimension two. Oh, for, yeah, let me stop here. Okay. In the trivial case, meaning this trivial case, yes. So if this is the case, only X is invariant. Right? So, so yeah, you don't have anything very interesting in this case. Okay, so let me go. Oh, sorry. Okay, I was talking about how to generalize Hironaka's theorem. Uh, and there is no theorem, but there is a conjecture. And the conjecture is um, uh, given any foliation. So, so for any F foliation X, there exists a proper Brasher morphism, exactly like there. Such that um, the induced foliation 
which I use, I use the word uh, wife tilde, is canonical, as canonical singularities. Okay, I think this conjecture is due to McQuillan. So let me, before I continue, let me say that um, um, we are not assuming that X tilde is smooth. Actually, there are counterexamples. There's a price to pay. Even if you start from X to X smooth, if you want the foliation to be nice, you either continue to work with singular foliations or you work with um, singular varieties, but better behave the foliations. So um, let me state what is the status of this conjecture. So this is okay for n equal to two by Seidenberg. This is an old theorem, and of course, he didn't use the word canonical, but um, it pretty much follows immediately from his theorem. Um, and n equal to three, rank one by McQuillan Panazzolo. And rank equal to two, three, and dimension three, sorry, by Cano. In this case, we can even assume X tilde to be smooth. Okay. And, <laughs> and N equal to the rank of uh, F, then it's okay by Donaka. That's right. Very good. <laughs> we can even do better than that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to cancel this. Okay. So we can start now. I have a question. Yes. Like does having canonical singularities for some foliation tell us anything about the singularities? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, I think the canon says something about this. Uh, no, you can have very singular, very best singularities with uh, nicely behaved foliation. I think tomorrow we're going to see examples and results in this direction. So there are some results, but uh, in general, it's not true. I mean, if you want very, very stupid example, Take foliation, okay, it's even more trivial than this. Take a foliation rank zero. Of course, it's stupid, right? But still, everything is log canonical. Bikes can be singular as much as you want. Okay, it's two. You can ask me, okay, why do you want to pick this example? Well, by perturbing this example, you can create uh, some other examples. So, yeah, pretty much uh, there is no easy statement uh, in this direction, yes. Okay. Okay, so where do we start? Um, so let's start from the minimum of the program. It's, oh, sorry, sorry, maybe let me start from n equal to two. So remember when I say n equal to two, I mean the dimension of the variety is equal to two, not the rank is equal to two. Uh, so the only interesting case, it's rank equal to one. I think that, although the same results holds for rank equal to two, but uh, um, it's not very interesting. Uh, well, I'm sorry, it's very interesting, but it's not very interesting for this, uh, uh, for the setup we have today. Uh, okay, so the theorem is due to many people. Uh, I believe McQuillan for sure should be mentioned. Then uh, I should mention also Brunella, Mendes, and others, probably. Um, we say that we can always find, I mean, the conjecture is true pretty much. Uh, well, part of the conjecture is true uh, and we know exactly where it fails. Uh, so we can always find, um, so if I, so we, sorry, before I continue, uh, since we have these partial resolution singularities, we don't start anymore from a random foliation. So I'm gonna start by F be a canonical foliation, a foliation with canonical singularity. I can do this for free in dimension two and three. So let's do it. Uh, it's exactly like for varieties. We don't start from any random variety, but we always take some kind of resolution. We apply it on a theorem, and we start the minimum of the program from there. So um, I want to do the same here. Um, so the theorem says that, um, okay, I'm a little bit in trouble. Um, so such that um, I will comment about this. KF is said effective. Then there exists a Brasher morphism. I don't know which notation I used before. Sorry about that. And this is really a morphism. 
is not in this case is not a brush on map also because um, we're on surface there, there are not many interesting brush on maps which are no morphism um, such that cfy is enough and of course i'm not going to say it anymore i'm not going to write it anymore uh, this is the foliation induced on y Okay, so a few remarks. First of all, I need to define what KF said effect means, and also I need to justify why I have this hypothesis. But before saying that, let me, before I forget, why is not smooth, not necessarily smooth, but um, uh, why has KLT singularities? So KLT singularities for surfaces just means that it's local analytically quotient singularity. Sorry? You can start with X smooth if you want. Yes, in this case, you can start with X smooth. But it's true, even if it's not smooth. I mean, as long as the single relation is canonical, it would be uh, probably you need to assume KLT. Sorry. Okay, you're right. Let me start with X smooth. Let me make it easy. But um, uh, you can surely start with X KLT. Uh, which is for free. So anyway, okay. So KF said effective. So why do I have this assumption? Well, KF this map it's KF negative. So if this is positive, we do need to expect that KF is positive in some sense. Otherwise, there is no way that this theorem is true. Okay. So KF said effective means that. Um, Okay, so that different kind of interpretation, probably uh, the easy one is that um, the Kodana dimension or the Taka dimension of MKF plus A is greater than zero uh, for any A ample and for any M sufficiently large, depending where sufficiently large depends on A ample. Okay, so another way to say it is that it's the limit of effective divisors in the effective cone. Um, okay, so maybe this is a good time to say something about what happens if KF is not set effective. So this is a theorem due to Miyaoka first, and I'm not going to say who did what, but uh, um, you can put things together in such a way to get this theorem. Uh, uh, Miyaoka and then Campana Pound, which says that I'm going to be sloppy. I'm going to assume that F is canonical singularities, although it's true in a more general setting. So let's suppose that F is canonical. Then KF is said effective if and only if, and I'm going to explain what it means, F is unirued. So this sounds like um, uh, the first word that I defined today. Uh, not said effective. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to do the opposite of what is written here. I wanted to see what happens if. Um, we are not in this setup. So this is in any dimension. So for any uh, N and for any R, for any rank. Okay, so let me explain what um, said effect, sorry, what the unit means. So it's stronger than what we had before. Because not only for general points, we have a rational curve, but we have a rational curve, which is tangent to the foliation. So F is new. If for any X general point, there exists a rational curve, of course, contained inside X, uh, such that um, uh, uh, C is tangent to F.
So you can assume that this curve is not contained in a single allocator defoliation because X is general. So tangent means just what you expect it to be true. Um, or you can even assume that uh, the point X, this curve, it's um, smooth. So tangent means that the tangent vector is contained inside TF for any such point. Okay, so we took taken care of both cases, right? I mean, thanks to this theorem, we have a good understanding of, we can even say more about that. We have a good understanding of foliation which, for which KF is not set effective. Thanks to this theorem, we know what happened for KF set effective. But if you remember the first conjecture, the first conjecture was say more. It was say something about canonical models. And like Kalu mentioned before, uh, canonical models do not exist in general. So I, I'm not going to mention too much, but um, this is due to McQuillan. So let's suppose that uh, KF is big enough. Okay, maybe I should define on a surface. And of course, rank one. Um, uh, big means that um, the quadratic dimension is maximal, is equal to the dimension of n, uh, the dimension of x. Or, yeah, I mean, let's take this as a definition. Um, okay, so, and it's possible to find examples such that, um, so, there exist examples uh, of such a picture where, I mean, if the conjecture I mentioned at the beginning was true, then we can contract everything which is zero with respect to KF. Okay, we can make KF ample. But there exists example of curves that looks like this. So it's a cycle of rational curves. You can say much more. You can say that the minus two curves and so on, such that, um, so this is, um, Misleading because uh, there are rational curves, but the Picard group of this curve here is non trivial. It's very much like an elliptic curve. So, KF restricted to this curve here, let me call it gamma, is degree zero, but not torsion. Okay, so this means that you cannot contract this curve to a point and hope that KF is the, you can contract the curve to a point, but KF is not the pullback of some ample device from um, that. So in other words, another way to say it is that KF is not semi-ample. So part of the conjecture which was mentioned yesterday, uh, sorry, which was mentioned today at the beginning um, is not true. Any question about this? Okay, so, um, I'm running a little, quite a bit late. So um, let me just say that um, there's a very nice interpretation of all this uh, due to many people. Uh, so let's see, Pereira, Svaldi, uh, and then uh, I think Spicer, Svaldi, and so on. So which says that uh, instead of working with the minimum of the program KF, we can work, uh, there exists an MMP for KF plus epsilon KF. Um, I'm still in dimension two, at least as far as I know, uh, everything um, works nicely in dimension two. Um, instead of working for, with KF or instead of working with KX, we can work with KF plus epsilon KX where epsilon is sufficiently small. And the MMP holds, and this also the, you don't have this kind of problem. So abundance holds and so on. So it's a nice setup because um, uh, things work well in this case. So, okay, I'm just gonna, uh, I'm not gonna say more details about this, but um, things work quite well for this object here. Of course you get different uh, MMP. You don't get the same um, um, output. Okay, so let's continue with the MMP in any dimension. Yes. So the expectation in general that the failure of abundance is, is always in a setup where you can actually contract. Uh, that's like 
There are examples where this is not true. We have an example, is it correct? Where three fold, uh, where, yeah, what you say is not true. Yeah, for a three fold. Yeah, for a surface, yes. Because, yeah, I should I say, McQueen theorem is much, much stronger. He not only says that there is such an example, but he can even classify all these examples. And then for each such example, uh, you can contract the curve, the corresponding yeah. curve. In a, uh, yeah, that's right, yes. In a, no, it's an algebraic space. Ah, okay. it's, yeah, yeah, that's right, yes. Yeah, it could be project, yes. So, so for this object, uh, it's low canonical, right? I mean, uh, so in other words, you can find low canonical pair which is zero, this guy. So it's kx plus this guy would be zero on this guy. So you can just blow up, uh, look, contract into some low canonical singularities. No, no, that's it, that's it, I don't need to see. That's it, yeah, pretty much, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah but in dimension three, things get quite nasty. So. I don't know exactly what is going on from this point of view. Okay, so yeah, let's start. So let's start the MMP in a higher dimension. So this is the equivalent. No, it's gone. But just now I wrote down the theorem for surfaces, which is the equivalent of the MMP for surfaces due to Castelnuovo and many others. Um, now, for n greater or equal than three, for varieties, we need to wait Mori, right? I mean, uh, so the whole thing started by Mori. And then there were many, many other results. So what did Mori do? Uh, so the first thing that Mori did was, okay, let's suppose we start with a variety for which Kx is non net So I'm gonna use the same language, but instead of using varieties, I use foliation. So let's start with a canonical foliation. Such that KF is non net Why? Why do I do this? Because uh, of course, if KF is net there's nothing to do, right? I mean, uh, we already arrived to the output. Okay, very good. So what, what do we expect? Well, the expectation is exactly what Mori proved um, long time ago, is the bend and break should hold. So this is a conjecture. Um, says that under this assumption, then there exists a rational curve. Sorry, for any x point in C, which is not contained the single locus of uh, f. There exists a rational curve um, passing through X. Uh, that's correct. Thank you very much. <laughs> that's right. Yes. Uh, I forgot to say something. Yes. Uh, also, there exists C curve C such that um, the F times C is, not, is negative. Why? Because it's not F. So there exists such a curve. So that's the obvious part. So the bend and break says that for any point of C, which is not contained in the square locus of F, there exists a rational curve, which is tangent to F. And here the word tangent is very important, such that um, KF times C is negative. Okay, so what, uh, before I tell you what we know about this conjecture, let me say the, about the cone theorem. Okay, so I need to fix some notation before I start uh, mentioning what the theorem is about. So um, uh, we say that two curves are numerically equivalent Sorry, these are cycle, they're not effective curves. They could be even cycle uh, one cycle, sorry. If for any device of D, which is Cucartier, we have D 
degree times C1 is equal to degree times C2. Why do I do that? The reason is because um, if we take the quotient by this relation, the quotient of all the one cycles by this relation, then we get the final dimension of vector space. So N1x, which is the quotient of the R vector space generated by one cycles, modulo numerical equivalence is finite degenerate. It's a finite dimension, sorry. Okay, so inside this cone, sorry, inside this vector space, there is the cone spanned by uh, classes which contain an effective curve, meaning that um, uh, curves, I mean, set one cycle with positive coefficients. So I will denote by NEX the cone, sorry, the one is here, spanned by effective one cycles. Okay, so this is, it's silly, a, um, it's easy to show, show that it's convex, it's a cone, of course. Um, and it's inside a finite dimensional vector space. So it's pretty easy to study. The problem is that we don't know much about this cone in general. This cone can look quite ugly, but um, thanks to Mori theorem, we have a much better understanding when KF is non F. And the same should hold for foliation. So let me state the conjecture now. So let's suppose that F is canonical. So I'm assuming, but I don't write it because it's obvious that KF is non F, otherwise the theorem becomes completely trivial. So there exists countably many rational curves. Um, which are tangent to F, such that, okay, this is a little bit difficult to visualize. I will try my best. If I take the closure of all these curves, which are effective, it can be decomposed in two, two parts. Those that are positive respect to KF, I'm gonna explain what this means. And those that are generated by these curves CI. So since it's an equivalent class, so since it's a quotient, I'm taking the equivalence class. And so I need to write it this way. Okay, so let me explain what this is. This is the set of one cycle inside uh, um, this cone here, such that Kf times C is greater equal than zero. So you should think that every divisor on uh, this space here, and one X defines an upper plane because, um, well, every Cartier device, sorry, uh, defines an upper plane by intersection. Okay, so I take the half space generated by um, the positive curve. So maybe let me draw a picture. And this is the classic picture you see uh, everywhere the cone theorem is mentioned. So if I it's a cone, right? So it's easy to cut a section and look at it from above. So if I take, if I take a section of this cone, there is one part for which we don't know very much at all. And then there is one that is generated by almost finitely many. It's not quite finitely many, but they can only overlap uh, on this hyperplane. So we have uh, the hyperplane defined by Kf equal to zero. So in other words, the, all the curves which are orthogonal to Kf. And then the rest, you should think of it to be convex. Well, this is not quite convex, but it's okay. Um, generated by these curves. Okay, so it's much, much nicer. So for instance, this part might not be closed. And any X might not be closed. But here it's closed because C1, C2 are curves. So they are uh, really in the border of, um, of this cone. Okay, so this part we understand quite well. This part, it's hopeless to understand what it means. 
Yes, please. Yes. Oh, so yes, yes. So every time, since I mentioned there's a trivial example, so you can always take f equal to x, and in the case, kf is equal to kx. <laughs> oh, that's a nice question. I don't know. It would be different for sure. For sure, it would be different. But um, kf will tell you something about the cone, and kx will tell you something. But there is no clear overlap. There might be some overlapping, but it's possible that there are different kind of uh, um, uh, how, what happens if I replace foliation with something else? So every foliation will give you a different decomposition. So if you have that Kx is different from Kf, you know more because you have that even this part is polyhedral and so on. So the more foliation you have, the more you can reach something which has, uh, it looks, this part is completely mysterious and it does exist because there are plenty of varieties for which the corner is for instance circular. And then there's one part which is somehow some kind of union of uh, different foliation. So yeah, there is no obvious, as far as I know, there's no obvious uh, relation between different foliation. So yeah, you can choose Kx, but of course you can choose many different foliation. Every time, for instance, you have a fabrication, you get uh, um, something like that, yes. So yeah, I'm gonna mention uh, in one moment. <laughs> what Any question? Yes, please. Or if it's completely circular, it means that there is not a single foliation for which Kf is non map. Every foliation has Kf map. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, it's a corollary. Yeah. If this conjecture is true, yes. And there are plenty of these examples. There are plenty of varieties for which um, such a thing happens. So what do you mean for that? So every fibration has a fibrous maze of something? Every fibration will have a, a corresponding canonical device. Or, uh, NEF, yes, exactly. I will talk, I will talk about the foundation case, yes. Okay, so I mentioned two conjectures. One is the bend and break, and one is, well, it's the Kuhn theorem, which is written here. So what is known? So of course, for n equal to the rank of, or in other words, rank of f equal to n, uh, everything's okay. It's due to Mori and other people, but I think that is fair enough to call it Mori's theorem. Uh, so it's okay. So I should say that Mori proved only the smooth case, even in positive characteristic actually, but only for smooth varieties. Then there are many generalizations due to Kawamata, sorry, to yeah, Kawamata, Koller, and Shukurov um, in more general setup. But let me say that for n equal to rank of f, everything's okay. Then for rank of f, equal to one, I shouldn't, I wouldn't need more space. This is also okay. Both theorems are okay. And um, it's due to Bogomol of McQuillan. So no matter what the dimension is, so I need to be careful because we don't know existence of a solution in high dimension, but still, if we do assume that F is canonical to start from, then everything's okay. Um, then I think N less or equal than three and rank equal to two. This is also okay due to Spicer, Kalum. And then another case, which we know to do how to do in any dimension, any n. So it's, it's okay for algebraic interval foliation. And this is due to uh, in myself, sorry, Ambro, uh, myself, uh, Shokurov, and Spicer. And maybe Callum will talk about this on Thursday. Um, so yes, every time we do have a fabrication, no matter what the dimension is, um, if the singularity are under control, actually we do it in a more general setup, but it doesn't matter. Um, every time the singularities are under control, we do have a decomposition like this. Okay, so I have four minutes. Let me talk about the base point free theorem. And then tomorrow we talk about um, uh, more fancy stuff.
So again, let's continue to go through the variation geometry of varieties. So if one follows the steps, so first is resolution singularity, then it's usually bend and break, then it's cone theorem. And then if we follow the history, uh, we have the base point free theorem. Or maybe sometimes the, canon, the cone theorem include the post point free theorem, but it's okay. I mean, I think it's fair enough. So before I mentioned, uh, again, this is a conjecture, but before I mentioned what the conjecture is, let me, let me try to justify why we need this kind of theorem. Okay, so let's assume that um, F is canonical. And um, KF is non F. As I say, if KF is NF, then there is nothing to do. So let's assume KF is non F. Okay, so this means that we do have such a decomposition. Okay, so what do we do with this composition? Well, okay. What I can do, maybe let me draw another picture. So I have something looks like this. And then we have, I didn't say much, but uh, if we move far away from this upper plane, uh, things are very nice. They're finitely many, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is KF. Now, what happened if I add an ample Q device? Or, or even just ample? So if I take KF and I start adding A, the more I add A and the more and the fewer uh, negative curves there are, right? So I want to look at KF plus DA. So since this is positive on every curve, the bigger is T, the fewer curves which are negative uh, appear in this picture. So let me draw a picture. So it's gonna be like uh, more or less like this. Okay, because at uh, some point there will be no curve. If T is large enough, it's easy to show, since this slice is compact, it's easy to show that there are no curves at all for which this guy is negative. So I stop at some point, this picture is misleading, so let me change a little bit the picture. I stop at the point on which uh, um, there is only, I mean, this hyperplane is tangent to this cone, whatever tangent means. So I stop at the point where a picture like this happens. Okay, so in other words, there exists, it's very easy to show that there exists lambda positive such that KF plus lambda A is nef but not big, sorry, not ample. What does it mean? It means that I arrive to the limit where there are no more curves on the right hand side of this picture, I mean on one half plane, but then there are curves on the hyperplane itself. So there are at least one curve inside the hyperplane itself. Okay. And all the other curves are contained on the other half plane. Okay. So now by using very simple um, um, convex geometry, this is really a basic uh, uh, convex geometry. We can, oops, sorry. Uh, we can change the ample cone, it's, it's open. So what it means is that we can perturb A. We can modify A in such a way that it's still ample. So such that if I take this guy here and I take the orthogonal part, I mean the set of curves on which is zero, this is only one extreme array, only one ray. So in other words, it's generated by one curve. I'm assuming that the cone theorem at all, otherwise we're in trouble. So assuming that the cone theorem is true, then there exists only one curve on which this is true. Okay, so in other words, the picture is not like that, but it's a bit better because um, it ends up like this. This is very simple, right? If it's like, if you are lucky to be in this situation, you just, uh, how to say, incline A in such a way, I mean, modify A in such a way that the upper plane is a little bit more inclined and you end up in this situation. Okay, so, so far everything is simple. And note that uh, automatically KF times C is negative. Why? Because lambda is positive. So maybe I should say it somewhere here. Oh, it's already written. Lambda is positive because KF is non-NF. Okay, so by 
by definition, Kf lambda is positive. So if you, since A is positive on C, this means that Kf must be negative. So we found a special curve on which Kf is negative because it satisfied the property that Kf plus lambda A is zero exactly on this curve and all its multiples. Okay, so the conjecture says that, and I'm gonna stop here. So under the same assumption, same setup, uh, Kf plus lambda A is semi-ample. I'm not gonna explain what it means. So in other words, there exists a morphism from X to Z such that for any curve C, Eta C, it's a point. If and only if uh, C belongs to R. So, in other words, um, we are contracting exactly those curves, which are numerically equivalent to a multiple of C. Okay, I will talk about this more tomorrow, but um, let me let me conclude by saying what we know about this conjecture. Well, it's always the same. Uh, so n equal to, uh, sorry, uh, equal to the rank. It's an old theorem due to Kavamata and Shukurov. Well, maybe I should say Shukurov and Kavamata. It's called the base point free theorem. Yep, and for n less or equal than three, it's due to myself and Kalum. Well, n equal to two, it's obvious. So uh, the only theorem, I mean, n equal to three is the only interesting case. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here. We do have a contraction given by the extreme array uh, given by C. And so tomorrow uh, we will continue. What do we do after we contract this curve? Okay, thank you. In the case that we understand uh, the, the, where we know that the point C unfolds, do we know that there exists always a extreme array which is of a, a k axis extreme array? Uh, I would say no. Let's see if I can come out with a counterexample. Um, I don't see any good reason for which this is true because, for instance, uh, you could easily have that k axis nf. You by kx extreme array, you mean kx negative extreme array, yes. I, I think that if I think a little bit about this, I can think of an example for which uh, kx, so there exists a fibration, we'll say without fiber, uh, multiple fibers, such that kx is nef, but um, kx, uh, of, so no multiple fiber. But kx over z is not nf. I'll be surprised if this is not true. And so this will be a good example. Kx is not nf, an extreme array. Kx is nf. Uh, if, if, if it's invariant, would be on a fiber. The shade. And then Oh yeah, that's a good, a bad example. Okay, very good. Um, how about if there is a multiple fiber? Yeah, but the conjecture is that they are invariant. If you have multiple fibers, yeah, exactly. You take out the reduced part and makes a like a sufficient fiber type. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, with multiple fibers. <laughs> so and here is not KX set, but it's KF. Thanks. Yeah. So I'm pretty positive the answer okay. is not. Yeah. Yeah. That already in dimension two. Yeah, yeah, you already in dimension two. Yeah. Even the example I mentioned before should be a context example. So.
about the source here and compared to the classical shape, uh, we still expect the negative ray to uh, accumulate near the. Yep, yep, yes, yes, yes. There is a version like that, yes. I didn't mention it, but uh, uh, if you take KF plus epsilon any ample, uh, there are only finitely many rays on which is negative, yes. <clears throat> No, there is no bound. I mean, we know that it's less infinity. No, it really, you can produce. Uh, okay, so sorry, maybe. So I'm not as so as written like this. It's very easy to show that there is no bound because I'm assuming that is Q divisor. If you're asking me instead of Q divisor and Cartier, then for KX we do have a bound. And so I do believe there is such a bound for KF. I will say that the same bound, we do expect the same bound should be true, meaning n plus one or something like that. But I don't know if that's the correct answer, but I do expect there is a bound, yes. Depending on the dimension only. But you do need to, of course, to assume Cartier. Otherwise you just take any ample line bound, you divide by a million and then you get a, I mean, yeah. Yes. I don't, I don't see, I, I never seen it written down. Yeah, I don't think so. I, mean, I don't know. The example of McQueen, no, base point free theorem. No, base, so, okay, you need to be careful about uh, KF big and F is different from uh, base point free theorem. There is no counter example. So yeah, no, rank one, we do expect it to be true, but. Um, what does McQuillan prove? He contracts in the, in, in the category of the generalized spaces, right? It's a good question, but no, I don't think that he proved that, yeah. Hasn't he proved that you have a, K, K, a model where you have Yes, yeah. but uh, they produce the way to produce flips, okay. <laughs> we are recorded, so I need to be very careful. But um, the way you produce flips, I'm going to talk about flips tomorrow, is not this way, but it's this way. Okay, so this is how Michael produced flips. So I don't see, I'm sure if you ask Michael, I might give you a different answer, but I don't see a way to produce this map here, this morphism. So in other words, instead of taking a flipping contraction and then whatever is come here, what it does is to take away the blow up and then it contracts. I don't see any good reason why this pink one implies the white one. But again, maybe if you ask Michael, it will give a different answer. Okay, before we, well, let's first thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so we go for lunch, then we can come back here for discussion or see doing exercises uh, or yeah, all the afternoon.